Hey everybody, uh, welcome to this week's episode of YouTube Developers Live. Uh, this week we're going to be focusing on a topic near and dear to my heart, uh, which is debugging issues with the YouTube data APIs and the YouTube player APIs, and uh, some best practices for how to obtain help whenever you do run into an issue that you're not able to debug yourself. Um, apologies for the folks who wanted to watch along with the show live, but we're actually doing a recorded semi-live version of the show. I assure you that I am live the API calls we'll be making will be live, so hopefully that'll be able to suffice for everybody. And um, I also wanted to point out this is probably going to be a little bit shorter than our normal shows where we have guests on, um, but you know, hopefully we'll have some nice focused content for everybody to dig into. So let's just jump right into things. Um, I wanted to just, as I mentioned, emphasize the fact that we want to make it possible for folks to help themselves um, when you are running into an error. Um, you know, usually the API will give you the information that you need in order to figure out what's going on and to solve the problem by yourself. And you know, that's, that's the ideal case. But we also want to help you uh, get the techniques that you know to report, you know, really meaningful um, issues to us. If you happen to notice something and it's clear that there is some sort of bug, you know, there's certain pieces of information, certain steps that we need on the, you know, the developer relations team side to like really effectively help you. So we'll cover some techniques for getting that as well. Uh, let's dig right in and we're going to start by talking about the uh, YouTube data APIs. Um, you know, data APIs is kind of like a big umbrella right now, so I'm talking about YouTube data API version 3. Um, a lot of what I'm saying also applies to the analytics API. Uh, a lot of what I'm saying will apply to version 2 of the data API. So, you know, I'll just say data API as a kind of catch-all. And uh, the one thing that's probably more important than anything else I wanted to point out about the data APIs is that they always return a response. Um, you know, this is a RESTful uh, API. Everything's made, every request is made via HTTP. Um, so you send our servers an HTTP request, we will send you back an HTTP response. Now, that doesn't always mean that it's going to be a successful API request. Uh, that HTTP response you know, might have an error associated with it, but we should always give you something that is hopefully meaningful enough to debug whatever's going on with your request and to identify the problem. So more important than anything else, know that you should always get back a response from the API. And I sometimes see uh, folks who raise questions in you know, Stack Overflow or the Issue Tracker and they say, you know, I'm not getting a response back from the API. Uh, really, the only case that should happen where you don't hear anything back is when your request never makes it to our server to begin with. And you know, this sometimes happens because people are in fairly complicated network setups, or maybe you know they're behind some sort of firewall, and uh, access to Google's API servers happen to be blocked on their network. Um, you know, if you're in that situation, it's not so much that we can do to help you. Um, you know, talking to your network administrator or just trying to you know, fiddle around with settings or try on a different computer uh, on a different network, all those are steps that you would have to take in order to resolve those sorts of issues. But, you know, that's a very, um, you know, that's, that's kind of an edge case. Uh, so for the folks who know um, how HTTP requests and responses work, you'll always get back um, a HTTP response code, and you'll also get back a status line associated with that code. and um, Usually, and certainly for requests made against our API servers, you'll get back an HTTP response body. So a combination of that HTTP response code, the status line for that response, and the response body is um, the information that you need as a developer to figure out what's going wrong with your API calls. Uh, it's not sufficient a lot of times to just look at the response code. Um, you know, a lot of times people will say, hey, you know, I'm getting back an HTTP 403 error when I make this API call. Um, there are only a certain number of valid HTTP response codes, so some of them are overloaded and reused for different types of, of errors. Um, you know, HTTP 403s usually have to do with unauthorized or, you know, forbidden requests. It, even <laughs> You know, even trying to come up with all the potential things on top of my head is a little difficult because there's a lot. So, you know, a lot of times the only way to figure out what's going on is to look at the actual body of the HTTP response. And in that body, you'll see more details about what caused the error. So it might be a quota error. It might be 
due to using the credentials for a different account when trying to access you know, the authorized information of a completely separate account. It might be because you're trying to access information that somebody has decided they don't want to make public, like their list of favorite videos or something like that. Um, there are specific error codes that will be in the response body associated with each of those types of failures, and again, you need to look. So the question um, you know, that everybody should ask as a follow-up for that is exactly how do I look? Um, a lot of times the, your interaction with our API is via our client libraries, and our client libraries do a great job of simplifying uh, a lot of common use cases, makes it really easy to make requests, it makes it really easy to deal with responses, but it also uh, kind of handles a lot of the details for you, including uh, taking the HTTP response and deserializing it and you know, converting it into a Python object or you know, Java object or something like that. So most of the time, the client libraries will, when they see an HTTP error response, turn that into an exception that gets raised by the native client library. And you know, this is a perfectly fine way of interacting with the API and, and handling things because the exception object that gets created, and again, this is kind of the specifics are, um, you know, vary from the J Python client library, the Java client library, things like that. But for the most part, there are going to be accessors on that exception object where you can get that underlying information about the HTTP error response, um, including, you know, what the error code, the HTTP response code was, the status line, the response body, all that sort of thing. But you know, sometimes you have to know exactly where to look, and maybe you're not just handling exceptions by you know properly looking at all the properties and getting the details. Maybe you just happen to be logging whatever the string representation of the exception is, and that makes it a little bit difficult for you to uh, figure out what's going on. So in that situation, um, your best friend is basically turning on HTTP level logging in the client libraries. And the reason that you have to turn on the client library level is that certainly for uh, all of our newer APIs, uh, and it's actually now the default for version two of the data API, all requests are made using HTTPS. Uh, so, you know, if you've ever made HTTP requests, you know, you could kind of like fire up a network monitoring tool like Wireshark and you know, just take a look at that raw HTTP traffic as it's being sent out. Um, you could obviously see some you know, information that might not, you might not want to be uh, explored in plain text across the internet though. So we are now using HTTPS for everything and in order to take a look at that raw data, you need to make a change in the client library to enable logging. So I'm gonna just quickly uh, walk through the steps for the Python client library, uh, making a V3 data API call and show you how to turn on uh, that HTTP logging and what the output looks like. So I'm going to quickly go to my terminal, um, make this a little bit bigger too. And if you run this code, uh, this is basic mychannel.py. Um, so I'll, I'll pull up the code in a second, but just to show you what is happening over here, I'm getting back an HTTP error 400. Um, it's telling me what it's requesting and it's saying no filter selected. So all I'm doing over here is relying on the Python client library's default behavior of um, printing out the exception when it dies. So this actually is pretty good, um, and that's great. You know, the Python client library does a good job of exposing really useful information uh, during you know, just the default display of the exception. But let's say I wanted to see the exact HTTP request that's being made and the response headers and everything like that. Um, and we'll get into a little bit later why you might want to get that information for debugging purposes. So I'm going to pull up the code over here. Um, this is a little bit of a uh, con contrived example because I ex explicitly did something wrong in this code to make it fail. But I'm basically going to be taking this line um, for, and let me just bump that up a little bit if I could remember how to do it here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, but if you could see this, this is HTTP lib2 debug level setting equal to four, and I'll include a link to the docs that explain how to do that for the Python client library. So this is basically telling the Python client library, hey, um, I would like you to turn on the highest level of debugging for all of your HTTP requests that you're making. So let's just see how that, uncommenting that line, uh, changes things around. So in this case, you could see all the HTTP requests that are being made. 
and you can see the response. And this is on the raw HTTP level. So you see over here, for instance, you know, this is the author authorization token that I'm using. Um, this is the actual URL that's being requested. Um, you know, it's request making a channels get request um, against googleapis.com, so that all looks fine. And I'm getting back an HTTP 400 bad request. And in this particular case, I happen to know what the problem is. Um, it's because I don't have mine equals true set, so there's no filter. So if I just run that again, you can see I get back, in this case, an HTTP um, 200 response. So everything worked fine in this particular case. So, um, you know, this is something that's specific to each client library, like I said, so you kind of have to look up the documentation for each client library and see how to turn on HTTP request logging, but it's super important and it's a really great um, debugging technique. So the other way you could debug calls made to the API uh, without, have to, without having to actually turn on HTTP logging is to make those calls in like a sandbox uh, type of context. And what we have uh, that provides that is the API's Explorer, which lets you experiment with all sorts of um, data API calls in this really friendly web interface. And I'm just going to make the same sort of uh, request over here. Let me actually just do a search.list. Um, so I'm going to put in, you know, part, actually, let me just do it without anything over here. So this just lets you make your same data API request that you can make from code within this web browser. And you see all the different options that you can set. So let me just not put in anything. And I know that's going to be an error because um, you need to set some filters and you need to say what you want, your parts. So if you look over here, you can see that this will give you the underlying HTTP request that's being made and the response in a really nice format. And it makes it easy to read. It makes it easy to pass it along to you know, uh, Stack Overflow or the issue tracker when you're asking for help. Uh, so you'll see over here that you get back this error, you know, required parameter part. Uh, and that gives you a pretty clear explanation. Hey, you know, I need to put in a part if I want to make a request. So I'm going to say over here, part ID. I'm going to rerun my request. And in this case, I get back result results. So, you know, this is good for both uh, seeing what trying to replicate a request is giving you an error when you're using a client library. You could just try to find the corresponding method in this API's Explorer and make the request from there and see what the response is in a really friendly format. Uh, one other thing to point out is that a lot of requests, uh, certainly for the Analytics API and some of the other uh, APIs, but even some data API requests require that you go through the OAuth2 flow before you can make those requests. Uh, you can do that directly from the API Explorer. So just because you're making a authorized request does not mean you, know, you have to use a client library. You could play around with the API Explorer in that case too. Uh, we have a brand new page in our docs that uh, is really awesome that, awesome if you're into this sort of thing like I am, um, that gives you a full breakdown of all the different types of errors that you can get back from uh, doing data API version 3 requests. So this gives you a kind of an atlas for things that could go wrong and um, what you could kind of prepare yourself for. So it's broken down into general errors, the type of things that could happen for any request, regardless of which service you're going against. And you know, these are the things that you'd expect, like what exceeded, or you know, bad requests with um, bad filters, or things like that. Um, there's also, for specific API calls, like for doing a search, you know, invalid search filter, or invalid video ID. So um, if you happen to get a specific error code, uh, you can Look it up on this page, and you can see a little bit more detail in the description field for the possible causes, and in some cases, you know, understanding the causes should hopefully give you an idea of how to fix the underlying problem. Um, that's pretty much what I want to talk about on the data API side of things. Uh, there's a completely different API that folks are probably familiar with as well, and that's the Player API. And Player API is um, as the name suggests, used for playing back YouTube videos. And we're going to talk about the Player API in the context of um, embeds on web pages right now. I know a lot of folks might be using the newer um, Android uh, Player API for embedding YouTube videos in Android applications. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is not necessarily related to that, but about more about the web embeds and debugging those. So the most important thing to keep in mind for web embeds 
is that things can go wrong. Um, the common way of handling and reporting errors back to developers when things do go wrong when you use the um, web embed API is via an on error handler. Uh, so this is a specific JavaScript event handler that will get fired whenever something happens that uh, impacts playback. Um, so I'm gonna do a quick live example of how that might work. So I'm gonna pull up the player API over here. Um, I'm going to grab a sample from our getting started guide for using the player API. This is a full working example. Uh, I'm gonna pull up a site called JSFiddle, which I happen to like for doing live JavaScript testing of things. Um, I'm gonna paste this right in here. This gives you a kind of playground where you can host HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, um, and it provides you with a URL that you can then pass along to somebody else, and they can run your code and see exactly you know, what the output is. So this is super, super useful uh, for debugging things in kind of a clean environment, but also for reporting problems. Uh, if you do happen to have any sort of errors that you're really not sure about with the player API, a lot of the times what we'll ask for is that you provide a simple um, reproduction of the, of the issue. Um, sometimes we'll say, hey, you know, you can give us the full site URL for your, you know, your live production site and we can see the error within the context of a bigger page. But if it's really just like a standalone, easily reproducible problem, putting it on something like JS Fiddle, and I'm sure there are other sites out there that do something similar, gives us a, a really good way of being able to look at the specific code. Um, we could then go and edit the code and play around a bit and, and try things out and try making some changes. So um, I highly recommend it. So what I did over here was take the code from the um, documentation for using the iframe player API and I pasted it into the HTML uh, frame within JS Fiddle and I'm gonna click run right now. So <clears throat> this is um, fortunately actually working because we, we do <laughs> strive to have working code within our documentation. So everything looks good. In this case, it loads up the sample video. Things are great. Um, I wanna show you how you can deal with an error situation though. And I'm gonna bump up the size over here of some things in order to make this a little bit more visible. So you can see that in the iframe player, we have um, the ability to define a bunch of events that are fired um, where, where handlers are fired in response to different uh, API states. So things like the API being ready or on the state change, like when the video pauses or plays and so on. Um, the example that we have in the docs doesn't show using the on error handler, but I could quickly put that in. So there's another uh, event called on error that can be fired. And I'm going to create an inline anonymous function to handle it and go over here and you know do the old alert and error. And in this case, I want to do e.data. Um, so the on error handler gets passed in this parameter e, and the data uh, property of e will have the error code in it. So you know, if I run it now, nothing's gonna happen because we have this great code and there's no errors, but it's pretty easy to create a, an error with the player API. So for instance, if you have an invalid player ID, so let me, sorry, video ID that you try to load. So let me just put in a bunch of um, junk at the end of that video ID and let me try to run that again. And what we should see is an on error occur. Let me try that one more time. Well, something happened. Um, <laughs> I could spend a little bit more time looking into this, but I don't want to take away from the rest of the show. Um, basically, if anything does go wrong, this on error handler should fire off. And in this case, you know, I was trying to just alert for the error message. Um, not exactly sure why it's not happening, but if in a real application, you know, you could do any variety of, of steps. You could, you know, log it to some sort of remote JavaScript logging console you have set up. You could, you know, take action by trying to like load in the next video when an error occurs. You could do any number of different things. Uh, the player API has, in the documentation, has uh, a list of potential error codes that you might run into, uh, similar to that list from the data API and things like error code two for an invalid 
uh, video ID 5 if the video can't be played in the HTML5 player, um, and a few other things here. So this is where that's documented. Um, I wanted to just give you the best practices, and I've kind of touched on these in the course of talking about the um, ways of getting debugging information, but the absolute kind of minimum useful information that uh, we need when you're reporting an error to us, you know, either on Stack Overflow or Issue Tracker, in order to effectively uh, figure out what's going on to help you with uh, your problem. So we really, really want um, the HTTP request and response trace if you're running into an issue with the data APIs. Uh, this includes both the HTTP request headers and um, the HTTP response headers and response body. Uh, this is really should be sufficient information um, to figure out pretty much any problem. If you are posting this in a public forum, you probably do want to remove your authorization value, even though you know OAuth2 tokens do expire after an hour, but you still probably don't want to post that publicly. But pretty much everything else other than that token, you could post publicly. And um, that will give us enough information to figure out what, what your request is, what you're getting back, um, you know, do any sort of cross-referencing with our internal logs that we need to do, and hopefully find a solution to your problem. So that's really the best um, information you can provide to us when you're running into an error with the data APIs. On the player API side of things, like I mentioned, a live reproduction on your production site uh, is certainly good if it's a, something very specific to the way your page layout is, and maybe you have a few different plugins running, and you know you're using jQuery and and something else, and you really can only reproduce the problem on a full website. Then you know definitely give us that site's URL. Uh, but the better way to do it is probably to use something like JS Fiddle and create a very minimal reproduction of the problem, and we'll take a look at that JS Fiddle. We could edit it a little bit, and we could play around with it live and try to figure out what's going on. So that's really what we're looking for uh, when you're trying to uh, give us information. And that's just ways for you, know, you to help us help you by giving us all the information that we need right up front. And that's pretty much what I wanted to cover uh, in terms of debugging and, and error handling and best practices in that space. Um, I wanted to do a quick shout out to the folks who are able to make it to our Los Angeles uh, video uh, we did a YouTube plus Google TV video hackathon uh, about two weeks ago now. So um, thanks for all the folks who came out to that. And it was great meeting a lot of you in person. And I think next week we're going to be returning to more of our traditional kind of sit-down show with uh, some guests, developers, who are using the API. And I think that's going to be a great show. So stay tuned for that at the same time. Thanks, everybody. And Jeff Posnick signing off.